Lord, for all these things, we'll give you the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. A little bit of review. We're still in blood covenant. Did that shock anybody? <clears throat> this is number 29. Can you believe this? We're talking, we started talking last week about marriage. This is the love covenant. The love, the love covenant. Not the love monkey. No, the love covenant. Okay, marriage. Now, why are we talking about marriage? Well, because marriage is the God-invented institution that shows us how to make two one. How to make two one. Now, God has given us this covenant for a very good reason. We have the covenant of marriage to show the covenant between Jesus and the church. Now, last Sunday, we went over in fairly minute detail, probably the first time in a long, long time that I had the chance to go, actually, word by word, verse by verse, through Ephesians chapter 5, the section on marriage. Man, that is awesome. So fun. We're seeing God had a plan. Okay. Now, we in this society have so messed with marriage. We have made marriage into some simple little something. They're saying there's a vast increase in unwed mothers. Do you know why? Because there's a vast in decrease in the number of marriages. People just aren't getting married. They're just having babies anyway. Okay? Wait a minute. What is God's intention here? What is it such a big deal? This is such a big deal. Why do I get so cranky when people come to me and ask me to marry them and things are not in right order? I, I get cranky about that. I'm, I'm a, a hard case about that. Actually, that's close to what I was called last time. But it was close to that. But hard case is close enough. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. God wanted to show us spiritual intimacy through natural intimacy. He wanted to show us something that we were able to do in the natural that we may understand better the supernatural. I love this idea. God gives us something this weekend. But what happens is we have a tendency to so mess up the natural that we miss the beauty of the supernatural. And then we're crying out, God, where are you? And you're going, hey, oi. Okay? The giving, we found out last week, that marriage is the giving of each other on behalf of the other. But it really is the giving of the husband on behalf of the wife. Jesus gave himself up for the church on behalf of the church. The husband has this awesome responsibility to be the one to represent Jesus Christ in this marriage. Now, I know some women that try their hardest to make marriage an equality of husband and wife. And listen, folks, in value and in importance, it is equal. It is absolutely equal. But in position and in role and responsibility, they are not equal. It is one of the most phenomenal things a woman can understand if she would just understand how to let this thing happen and relax. The freedom in it is phenomenal. It's when the woman is trying her hardest to become the man that there's nothing but turmoil. You're not a man, nor would you ever want to become one. Yes. Amen, is that right? And we're glad you're not one. Hallelujah. That's right. I like the idea that my wife is not one, nor does she try to be one. I love this aspect. Now, does that put more responsibility on me? Yes, big time. Ten, four, and you got it, and she just sits there and smirks. She knows that. She goes, ah, 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 throw you out there. You like it. She likes it. It's a freedom. This has nothing to do that the woman is lesser. No, 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 no. Value? Huge value. We also found out that it's not just a... Of course... Around here, the women say, I may not be the head, but I'm the neck that turns the head. Yes. Yeah. There's something about a 15-year-old girl that has never been married to saying all this or something, hasn't there? Yeah. Misses something. Okay, on the translation. Okay, thing turned. There we go. Home first. We found this out last week. This is a big deal. Do it at home first. And then you can work on the church. Actually, there's another scripture that we could use very strongly on this. It's Acts chapter 1, where it says, First there was Jerusalem. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Jerusalem. We don't live in Jerusalem. 
your, your mother doesn't even live in Jerusalem, does she? No, I mean, she lives in Israel, but she doesn't even live in Jerusalem. Well, we're not all going to go live in Jerusalem. How come it says that? The witness. Well, the witness was first in Jerusalem. Okay? Okay? It was first there. But this is in Acts. It says the Holy Spirit come upon you. You shall be my witnesses. First in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria and the other parts of the world. But there's more to it than that. God has greater meaning than just their geographical location. Where is your Jerusalem? Where are you to be the witness of? Your Jerusalem is where you live. That's the home. Our home is, in, is Jerusalem. Where is Judea? Well, if you haven't figured it out, Jerusalem is in Judea. When are we going to start ministering to the church? After we get Jerusalem handled. Folks, listen, don't try to think that you have a ministry in the church until you have the thing happening at home. I've known too many people that, whose home life was chewed to shreds, their marriage was a wreck, and they tried to become a minister in the church. Sorry, it's out of order. doesn't work. Can God use people? Yes, God uses people out of his grace. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be here either. Right. It's not on our merit that we get to minister. But listen, the way it should work is home first. And then in Judea, which is the church. Where was Samaria? Well, it was next door. What was the Samaritans considered? Yeah, well, worse than that. They were the outsiders, man. They were those, oh, we didn't even want them. And God says, oh, no, no, you're going to witness in, in Samaria. What was the whole goal was to make Samaria Judea. What is Samaria? The outside world. The whole idea is to make them into Judea, get them into the church. Well, listen, you don't have a ministry outside the church until you have it first in your home and then first in the church. Okay? There are orders by these things, making Samaria into expanding Judea to cover Samaria. Until when, does we, when do we stop that? Until we get the farthest parts of the earth. That's the whole idea. Hey, you're not doing it out there if you're not doing it here. Don't mess with marriage. Don't mess with marriage. Marriage is the covenant that God has given us to show the relationship between Jesus and the church. Did I get too heavy too quick? This is still review. Remember this. God and man. There's a special relationship here. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's good. But where did we get that love? Well, we love him because he first loved us. And so he gave us his love, which gave us the love to love him with, which gave us his love, which gave us more love to love him with, which gave us more revelation of his love for us, which gives us, anyway, we go. That's a good thing. Do, number one. And then comes, oh, I put woman up here. Woman does this too, by the way. She loves the Lord her God with all her heart, soul, strength, and mind, and she goes out. But the understanding in the scripture says, husbands, love your wives. The command was not wives, love your husbands. How about that? The command to women was submit. submit. <laughs> okay, one more time. The command to women was to submit to your husbands. To submit to your husbands. That's cool. Okay, submit. That's one of those words. That S word. You know, we were talking last night at a we had a party for um, Roxy's school, and the teachers were were up there, and one of them says. That, what they need to do is interrogate or interview all the second graders and find out what they consider to be cuss words. Why the second graders? Because they would come up and say, Mrs. Mrs. Eddie, Julia said the S word. The S word? You, know, you better find out what the S word is. We need to find a list. <laughs> Call me stupid. <sighs> no. Okay. <laughs> You never know whether you've got to get a list, you know. But We know that the relationship to the woman, if he's going to love her, he's got to have the love to love her with. He's got to get this relationship first. That one is what's important before. If you don't get the one between man and God going, if you don't love the Lord your God, you'll never love the, do the second command, which is love others as yourself. And the Bible says to love her. The, end, the last verse in chapter 5 is that the husband love her as he loves himself. Well, what is that? The second command. But if we don't have a relationship with the Lord, so we get the first command going, we have no love to love her with. And these women are going, when are they going to love me? The biggest problem in a wife, the biggest problems wives have, security. Well, I'll tell you something. If she knew she was loved, there would be no security problem. If she knew she was being loved with the love that God has through that man, I'll tell you, it's going to take care of her. You know, it's kind of neat. Hold that thought. I'll have to hold that thought because I didn't get into it yet. Okay, we'll go on here for a second. Don't forget, Lee. Okay. Now, 
We also have this thing in covenant. I have a covenant with my Father God. How cool. Through Jesus Christ. And the woman. Whoa. Only, only does this work. I, unequally yoked. That is the most dangerous thing on the planet. The Bible says do not in any way, shape, or form be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Man, if they don't know Jesus Christ, do not enter into covenant with them. That is a false thing. Why? Because I'm entering my covenant with God with somebody who doesn't have a covenant with Him. That doesn't work. Uh-uh. Don't do it. Do not do that. But if I have a woman whose covenant is with the Lord and my covenant is with the Lord, then man, our covenant together makes a phenomenal thing. Why? This is kind of cute. See that little triangle? Now there's a big triangle. It's showing godliness through our whole everything. Through our marriage, we get to exhibit who God is. Amen. Getting all excited. This is so cool. It's our homes that show who God is on the planet. If we can show in our homes the power of God working, guess what? We win. We are able to show that to everybody on the planet. I can always bring them home. I can always bring people home and say, they say, there's no God. <laughs> Come home with me. Number one, I'm going to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. No, because I married her. <laughs> I got in trouble on that one. <laughs> I'll bring you home. I'll show you that it works. Christianity works in my home. Does it work in your home? Man, Christianity works in my home. I love it. I can always bring people home. I can show them the whole thing. Because if I can show them this covenant... God gave us the man-woman covenant. He gave us the relationship between a man and a wife, husband and a wife. Gave us that so we would know the relationship between, I would know my job and my understanding of the relationship between Jesus and the church. God, this is awesome to me. I got this one. It has too many sentences, only one mouth. It has enhanced my, my walk with the Lord. It has enhanced my covenant with Him, knowing my covenant with my wife. It has enhanced it. Whoa. When I make it work between man and woman, I see how it works between Jesus and me. This is phenomenal. Now, it doesn't mean I have to have it all together before I can have it all together. I don't have to have it all together in my marriage before I can have it all together with Jesus. It's a, it's a back and forth thing. I see his relationship and I apply it to this relationship with me and my wife. <laughs> and I see how this works and I go back to him and go, woo, and I get understanding. God, this is great. This thing, this thing between husband and wife and Lord and the church is awesome. And it also is how the woman can understand her covenant with the Lord. It was Roxanne who figured out to a degree, it was to a degree, her covenant with the Lord, right when I was being the major butthead of the world. I, I reserve the right to understand. I, yeah, I've seen some real problem children, in my, but I got to beat. Man, I was bad news, okay? My wife finally said, I can't do anything with him. He's a wreck. He's going to wreck us. But, God, I have covenant with you. And you have covenant with him. Now, the thing is, if, if Roxanne has covenant with the Lord, and the Lord has said, all your enemies are my enemies, she looks at me and says, God, he's my enemy. Sick him. God says, okay. And my life fell apart. Right there in front of everything. God picked me up, shook me around for a while. Blah, 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 blah. God, why are you on my back? Because your wife is on my back. Now, it sounds funny. It wasn't funny to me at the time. Is there such kind of praying like that? Oh, boy. I'm in covenant with God. I'm in covenant with somebody else. Man, can I pray covenantal prayers? That's what we're going to talk about a little bit next week. <laughs> don't you love teasers? No, don't. Proverbs 2.17, it's talking about this promiscuous woman who is enticing men off the street. I mean, she's really, she's a bad news babe, I tell you. And it talks about her and says, who forsakes the guide of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. What he's talking about, okay? He's talking about the promiscuous woman. He's talking about sex and her marriage covenant. God says for certain right there, she is missing her covenant with God. Now, see, the marriage covenant is the covenant that gives us understanding. If she's going to forsake her marriage covenant, what's she doing with her covenant with the Lord? Okay? This is kind of fascinating. God makes the correlation. Wow! Is that tight? That amazes me. This one just kind of like blows my little mind. 
Am I going too fast? I feel like I'm down the road. Okay. Malachi. No. Malachi. 2. 14 through 16 says this. Yet you say, on what cause? Because Jehovah has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. God's saying, okay, dude, you messed with your wife. <laughs> and she is your companion, your covenant wife. And has he not made you one? Yet the vestige of the, of the Spirit is in him. And what of the one? He was seeking a seed of God. Now guard your spirit and do not deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. Jehovah, the God of Israel, says he hates the sending away and to cover with violence on his garment, says Jehovah of hosts. Then guard your spirit and do not act treacherously. Now, what's the subject here? Marriage. Marriage. What's he saying? You have de dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth and I personally will deal treacherously with you. We, we think that this is not a big deal in today's society. I'm sorry, it is a big deal. God himself is against this thing. He's against messing with marriage. Marriage is very, 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 very important to him. And the more we have ministered marriage, and we've been pushing on this marriage button for a long time. That's one of the big deals right after I got set free that I was hitting up God about. God, why did you invent sex? And he said, wrong question. Why did you invent sex? Marriage. Okay. The whole thing about my getting set free from sexual addictions was to get my marriage back in order. Now, God was really strong on this thing because he was on to my marriage. Okay. It was not just about me. It was about me and my marriage to my covenant partner who had a covenant with him. And God was very, very intrigued and very strongly involved in getting this marriage back together to get the covenant working. Man, we started pushing on that button way back then. And then we started getting... More and more and more into it. And pretty soon we found ourselves working at the offices of Marriage Ministries International. Okay, what used to be called Nova Shalom. Way back when. So here we were in the offices. We had not even taken the course yet. Okay, we were in the office. Fact is, when we left to go to Russia, we had still not taken a course. All we'd done is a, we call it a leadership weekend. Which means all 13 weeks, it was 13 weeks at the time, all 13 weeks was jammed into two days. And we likened that to taking a drink from a fire hydrant. You know, I'm ready. That will clean you out. <laughs> it was a, an experience. But we really loved it. But we got in with all these people who were ministering to marriages. thought, wow, this is really important. Then we left for Russia. We got over there, and the first thing that happened was they threw me into being a pastor of a church. And I am not kidding. We, we got in on Friday. By Monday morning, I was pastoring a church, and I didn't even know it. They had it set up, man. What? They all knew about it before I did. Everybody was looking at us on Sunday morning because we went to the church I was going to pastor. And I didn't know about it. And everybody's looking, oh, this is Lee Eddie. Oh, what are you guys talking about? You know, we're still in jet lag. We couldn't put sentences together. I, I slept through the message. I'm not proud of it. No. <laughs> and I don't know how I did because he screamed the entire time. So, kind of fun. But... We didn't know what was going on. Monday morning, they said, we want you to pastor that church. You're the only guy that has any experience pastoring. And the pastor of the church has been called back to, back to Canada. He says, uh, you're it. Tag. Thank you. So we get in there and we get to talking to the missionaries. Right? And they're supposed to give us six months to do nothing. We get acclimated to the society and to living overseas. They gave us three days. Thank you. <laughs> So we got to talking to the missionaries and we started talking to them about their marriages and started finding out that the missionaries' lives were chewed to shreds and these people that were high A personalities, you know, what you call A personalities, not the passive but the very aggressive, the high A's, every missionary in the whole field was like that. And they got there by just plain bullying their ways through and beating up on everything and they just by chutzpah just wrecked everything and, and got money and came to Russia. They had that kind of personality. And then you get a bunch of these in a room, and we're supposed to work together. Well, guess one of the things that suffered? Guess what really suffered is their marriages. So we got to talking about, you know, what you guys need. We need to do a Married for Life course for the, for the uh, missionaries. We thought, well, we'll wait until, you know, we were trying to stall it off. And this one guy says, if you wait three more months, there will not be a marriage to heal. That's one of our missionaries. We went, 
Okay. So we called up Marriage Ministries International, Mike Phillips, and this is the laugh heard around the world is what we've called this, okay, because we had to humble ourselves and ask him, calling from Moscow, Mike, we've never done a group. We've, we resisted that the whole time we were working for him. I said, uh, would you clear us to do a group, a Married for Life group in Russia for the missionaries? And he started laughing. He said, I knew we got you. You know, Turkey. So we did. We, we, they sent us the books. They sent us the stuff. And we did a Married for Life group. Our first one was in Russia. Okay? To missionaries. And the couples who really wanted it, that made us do it, didn't even come. And we ended up having this really phenomenal... Boy, it was powerful. Well, then we found out that our church in Russia, nobody had ever taught them on marriage in any way, shape, or form. And so we did a Married for Life group in Russian. Our second one was in Russian. Okay? We don't speak Russian. So we had to use an interpreter. 18 years old, never been married, and this kid <laughs> sitting there having to be our voice, our eyes, our ears, our whole communication, and this poor kid went through this whole thing. Yo it started doing that effect. We started pushing on that. Pretty soon, we started raising, we got accosted by another couple who wanted to do this, that had had this done to them in Latvia, and uh, they wanted us to train them in this ministry. So pretty soon, the last three years of our life in, in Russia was just doing Married for Life, Marriage Ministries International, establishing that in the former Soviet Union, and we are in charge of over 10 time zones to teach on marriage, and traveled around and did nothing but do these 13-week courses in four days, three and four days, and do this for couples out there and travel out and train up the couple, a Soviet couple that we had. Uh, fascinating. You know what we've learned? We've learned that marriage is highly important to God. And we have learned that when couples don't respect their marriage, they don't respect the Lord. And if they will compromise in marriage, they will compromise on almost anything else. And if they won't take the Word of God and apply it to their life and their marriage, then you can't trust them for ministry because they will not be there. They will be able to compromise. And they will fall apart. And we have found this to be the key thing to raising up leadership is to get their marriages healed. Amen. We don't compromise on this. I have compromised a few times and it has bit me big. And uh, I just don't. That's what makes me a real hard case about this thing, is that we've been bit. We know that this is about the covenant with their wife. God says, you're dealing treacherously with the wife of your youth, and I ain't putting up with it. You're going to mess up everything. Why? Because it's a picture of Jesus in the church. And if, if I allow people to just divorce indiscriminately and marry anybody they want, what am I saying? I'm saying that God doesn't care. And the people are throwaway. And the covenant doesn't matter. Right. And after 29 messages on covenant, I'm hoping you get the idea that covenant matters to God. Right. Now why? That's why we're in this. Okay. Was that a little heavy? Everybody understand where I'm coming from? <laughs> I didn't intend to go there. But that happens. Okay. God did. Let's talk about the marriage covenant. We're going to have some fun today. Because the marriage covenant is joining two fam families... <laughs> two flams, two fam sins together. Two families or clans together. This has always been a big deal. Uh, always been a big deal to Israel. If you marry outside of your, your um, tribe, I know I get it right, you don't marry outside of Israel. Well, that was just like, that was really bad. Okay, that was just really, really bad. Now, you like my little Viking guy? Isn't he cool? Let's talk about the best man. Way back when, in uh, England and Scotland and Ireland and these places, they would, clans would get together and some guy would see some chick and say, whoa, baby, and they would kind of fall for each other. And it was like, the, it's the old Romeo and Juliet, the Montagues and the Capulets all together, okay? Nobody was digging this thing. They didn't want them together because it joined families. Well, the understanding was if this guy and this girl wanted to get together and they wanted to get married, if they got married, it joined those clans. There was nothing anybody could do about it. You, well, you could kill them. But it didn't matter. It entered into covenant. It put this family into covenant with this family. And there's nothing you can do about it. And they would try their hardest to break these things up. So, 
if I were going to marry Roxanne, and I knew that she was of a different clan than I was, and this thing, they were going to try to break it up. So we would try to do a secret wedding. <laughs> Get out there, and what would I do? My best man was not the guy I wanted to stand next to me going, yeah, this is right, yeah, this is good. No, I found, I would get the best man with a sword. Okay, my best friend that was the best one with a sword. That's who I would get. And he would stand outside the place where the wedding would happen, and he would try to hold off everybody until the wedding was finished. That's what a best man was, was the best man with a sword. <laughs> I love this. Okay, now Randall... <laughs> has this wonderful story that I'm going to tell on him because this is fun. Uh, his son Shane, all the years of growing up, Randall put the seed into Shane saying, I want to be your best man at your wedding. I want to be the best man at your wedding. I want to be the best man at your wedding. So I get to do Shane's premarital counseling and I'm going to do the wedding. So Shane comes in to me and says, you in for a conspiracy? And I says, against who? He says, my dad. Says, I'm in, whatever it is. I'm in. Here we go. And he says, I've, we've told Dad that we're not going to have a best man. So I'm liking this already. <laughs> and he says, so what we're going to do, he says, is I'm going to, I want to buy the Braveheart sword. And so we got online. I said, well, I'm your man there. <laughs> I know every website just about. And we found a battle-ready Braveheart sword, seven and a quarter pounds of high-carbon steel. <laughs> and we bought it. And I bought it for him. He paid me. And I had it shipped to my house so I could play with it before the wedding. <laughs> I'm not stupid. Anyway, and we got this thing. And during the wedding, this was what was so funny. During the wedding, the first thing that happens, and we had rehearsal and everything and changed it, see. We knew what was going to happen. And wedding day comes. Randall's sitting in the front row. Shane comes in. I come in first. And Shane comes in. And I pick up a microphone and hand it to Shane. Now, this wasn't during the rehearsal. This is during the... right. And Randall's looking like, what are you doing? And Shane turns around to the crowd and says, the term best man means the best man of the sword. And he tells that whole story. And while he's telling that story, I walk around the table, and they're wrapped in all this purple satin was this sword that was hid from, hidden from view. And I unwrap the thing, and I come over, and I hold the sheath out to Shane. And Shane reaches back and pulls this sword out and goes, Shh! like this. And he says, so, Dad... My father has always been the man to do the fight for our family spiritually. And it would be an honor for me. And he reaches out. This, we're starting to choke up already. No, no, no. And he, he held this sword out and says, Dad, would you stand? And would you stand for me and be my best man? And presented him that sword at the wedding. That was taped, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> did, did the whole boo-hooing come out? <laughs> did it catch you crying? <laughs> Back to the camera. Back to, but you see the shoulders going like this. Uh, messed with him pretty bad. So Randall took the sword and he stood up next to Shane and stood there with that, with his hands on the end of that sword, glaring at me. <laughs> it was just one of those, maybe this wasn't the smartest thing to do. <laughs> I don't have a sword up here. He's going to whack me in half as soon as I say amen at the end of this thing. That's going to be the end of it. But what was funny is after I told Shane of the website, he went home that day and went into to Randall and says, Hey, Dad, you in for a conspiracy? And he says, against who? He says, Lee, I'm in. Same conversation. <laughs> we have this wonderful relationship. I don't know how it works. And uh, he bought a sword from that website that looked the most like the sword on my logo, Cross and Sword Ministries. And he, I came in one day, and he was standing across the office, and he says, come here. And he whipped that sword out from behind him and said, I'm going to present this to you for doing our wedding. And I went, whoa. Now, Randall thought, we got Lee, we got Lee. And he even played with my sword. See, we're even. <laughs> he played with my sword, and then they got it. And he was so into the cons conspiracy of buying a sword for me and everything, and he was so stoked. And then when the wedding comes, and we busted him. See, we won. <laughs> that was too fun. Okay. It ain't over. <laughs> joining two families. See, they understood covenant equals covenant. They're joining two families. Then there's the vows. Now, vows are fascinating. All of these things are covenant understandings. They're covenant language. What are the vows? Vows are spo spoken personal commitments. It's not a contract. It's a spoken personal commitment. Now, I have here, I got lots of things here.
Well, no, I've got two copies. Because oh. one goes to her. You're welcome. <laughs> this is a, I have a file of the different vows that we have used in, in weddings. And this is about my favorite. This one is a good one. Now, what do vows do? Vows are personal, spoken commitments. They're not a contract. This isn't saying, okay, I'm going to hold you to what you said. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what I said, okay? I only speak what I shall do. It states the conditions for better, for worse, etc. It gives the terms of the covenant on how long it lasts. Till death. How interesting. And it requires witnesses. Back, boy. Back, back, back. I said, back. Thank you. Okay. Let me read these to you. This is the, the vows that I did for my sister and her husband, Phil. Okay? And I, I did these for her. Listen to how well they said. And I looked to Phil, and I said, Phil, do you vow? This sounds strong enough? Do you vow to take Carol to be your wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until you are separated by death? He said, I do. What? Did you hear that? He vowed before God to keep her to from this day forward, never, never a break, 24-7, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health. He vowed before God to love her. God is love. Oh, mercy. And to cherish her until he's separated by death. Now that is a traditional, that's a traditional um, vows. This is from Shane and Amber's wedding. Shane, do you vow to love Amber for richer or poorer, cherish her in sickness and in health? Do you vow not only to fulfill your Christ-appointed role as husband, but to also defend her honor and protect her life with your, with your own to death as long as you both shall live? Anybody like those vows? These are heavy. What is kind of fascinating is that Amber's are longer than Shane's. Amber's said... Do you vow to take Shane as your husband, forsaking all others? Do you vow to submit to him, to obey him, to support him throughout life? Do you vow to not only hold God higher in esteem and to be Shane's helper as God would lead you? Do you vow to strive in your marriage to grow in Christ, helping your husband to seek his role in Christ that you both may be as God intended? Do you vow to love him with all you are and all you have in joyful times as well as times of tribulation until your bodies be laid to rest? <laughs> They're they're. <laughs> I thought you'd like these. I thought these are these are really funny. Funny, absolutely funny. This is a this is a set. Jared says. <laughs> Tiffany, I thank God for putting you in my life as my friend and companion, my wife and my lover for life. I promise to love you and respect you to stand by you and be faithful to you, to be open and honest with you, to always work toward our mutual growth. I promise this with the help of God for the good times and the bad times, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish and to honor and protect you till death do us part. That's what Jared said. Quit hitting him with your elbow, Tiffany. What is... She didn't. I just thought I'd say that. Okay. But Tiffany said, Jared... No, he is. God, I was just seeing who was paying attention. Okay. Tiffany said, Jared, I thank God for putting you in my life as my friend and companion, my husband and my lover for life. I promise to love you and respect you, to stand by you and be faithful to you, to be open and honest with you, to always work toward our mutual growth. I got typos in this. I promise this with the help of God, for the good times, the bad times, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish and to obey until death do us part. The only difference is she vowed to obey. Isn't that fascinating? What part of any of those was stipulated on the actions of the other person? Nothing. Nothing. My personal vow is that this is what I'm going to do no matter what you do. 
Ew. Praise God. How was your vows? Those of you that are married, can you remember them? I'm just sitting there going, hey, you guys are thinking hard. Oh God, what did I say? <laughs> what did I commit to? Okay, it requires witnesses. Vows are cool, aren't they cool? I don't mess with them. They're, I want stuff in there that's solid. I don't do prenups, by the way. A prenuptial agreement, so in case this all falls apart and nobody's held liable. No, I want you held liable. I want you held liable. None of this prenup stuff. Sorry. Tokens were exchanged. Now, in the vows, what are the vows? The vows were uh, in a covenant where I just get make my commitment. That tells the terms and the length and the conditions by which this vow will be fulfilled. That's covenant. Covenant language. You don't have this thing happening in anything other than a covenant. How fascinating is that? There are tokens exchanged. Here's, here's the token that I wear. Now, this is kind of fascinating. What are the rings? What are the rings? Well, for one, they're usually made of gold. Why? Gold doesn't tarnish. How cool is that? Okay? It doesn't turn your finger green. It doesn't, does it? Any of you guys have your fingers turn green? I got a copper one! What do you mean? You know, okay, what's up with that? It's, it's not tarnishable. It's round, meaning what? There's no end. There's no end. I love that about rings when I look at them. Now, my ring is kind of is really cool. I love this ring and her rings. We got new rings. Uh, we got these filigree gold rings, and we are wearing them out. We just wore right through them. It just like is really, really bad. And mine got, got really tight. And uh, you know, here's, yeah, this is mine. Hers, what happened to yours? I got one from our, our famous boss from Russia. Yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> He's not going over that knuckle. <laughs> Would you knock it off? <laughs> now see, see that, isn't that nice filigree rings? Aren't those nice? We love those. I thought those, I, I, they just wear out easy. I, it fits on my pinky now. I growed up. <laughs> here's, here's our new ones. Um, they're Black Hills Gold, and they have the um, vine and grapes on them. Vine leaves, and the leaves are different. Um, um, uh, well, colors too, but uh, alloys. I get, uh, Amalgrams, all it came up with, and I know that wasn't right. Okay, alloys. They're really neat rings, okay? They're, but they're round, and they're made of gold, okay? They are a symbol of what? They're not aluminum. It's not for recycling. Okay? <laughs> this isn't for recycling, folks. These rings are to stay. You want to see them? Here's both of them. Okay? I wear her ring, she wears mine. Actually, she wears mine and hers and everything now. <laughs> okay? Why? It's a token of covenant. I wear Roxanne everywhere I go. Rock, excuse the foot, sorry. Roxanne wears Lee wherever she goes. What is this a symbol of? I'm Roxanne. I live for her. I live for her. How fascinating. This is my covenant. Man, I'm walking in a covenant. I walk around as if I were her. That's scary. Do you realize how much I've embarrassed her? In this event? Okay. I'm reminded to live for her. Now, do I ever take my ring off? Yes, because I'm not stupid. When I work with electrical stuff, I'm sorry. I take my ring off. It just doesn't, doesn't cut it. Okay. I work on the forge. Just what I need is to smash the ring into my fingers. I don't do that. Okay. I do take it off. It's just a piece of metal. This is not the covenant. The covenant is inside here, but it is a reminder. It is a token of my covenant. And I wear, sometimes I'll forget to put it back on. I'll tell Roxy, oh, I'm not married. <laughs> she says, you want to bet? <laughs> okay, I'm married. Okay. It's the death to independent living. Living? Living. I carry this with me wherever I go. It's the death to independent living. Am I, are we having fun yet? Okay, isn't this fun? Okay, those of you who are married, you're wearing a ring. <laughs> and, and the women say, you want to see this rock? <laughs> <laughs> the rock of Gibraltar. Of this thing. Roxanne does not have a diamond. Why? Lee poor boy. <laughs> That's the way that works. Would I want her to have a diamond? Absolutely. But I, this works, okay? It doesn't... doesn't you know. Okay. Let's go to another part of the wedding ceremony. I love this part. Uh, the blessing. The blessing. This is a seminar for you, right? <laughs> You're just taking these notes. <laughs> Where is that husband? Boy, I tell you, we're gonna, I'm going to send you home with one of these. He's going to have to listen to it. That's, 
He's got a gun. He's up hunting. Ah, that's right. He didn't shoot anything last time. <laughs> ah, rats. Okay. A blessing is a release. This is a blessing of release from the parents. If the parents will bless this, these children, bless this marriage, whoa, what a beautiful thing. I have just known too many weddings that had no parental blessing. That's harsh. That's tough. What would happen? I mean, my kids, I've got two, they're still not married. If Miranda came home and says, Dad, I fell in love with this wonderful man. He's a Buddhist, but he's a wonderful man. Will you marry us? The answer is no. <laughs> Will you bless us? What? <laughs> until death, yeah, just until the duct tape rots. Okay, <laughs> just no. What? No, what do I do? Would I be able to bless her wedding? She said, "I'm going to get married." No. Are you going to come? No. You say, "Well, you are a hard case, aren't you?" Yes, I am. Why? I'm not messing with what God has given us as an understanding of His covenant. I'm not messing with it. It, will there be a blessing? No. You would withhold a blessing from your child? Absolutely. <laughs> you guys thought it was harsh before. Now you know how harsh I can really be. I, I'm not going to mess with this. Why? Unequally yoked. Ain't happening. I'm going to follow the scriptures before I follow an emotional response. But daddy, I want you at my wedding. <laughs> then marry somebody that's of God's choosing, not of your own. Okay? That's why we don't date. Okay? They don't date. Why? Because it's us choosing a mate. No, we're of the Jewish understanding that the father chooses the mate. Well, <laughs> not this father, that one. The one in heaven. He knows all three billion guys on the planet. He knows which one is the exact one that will handle her. Oh, Lord God. Hey, tell me I'm not telling the truth. Okay. Yeah, see? No. Okay? I'm not, we're not doing dating. It's the way it is. I'm not, it's not up to you to find your mate. It's up to God to. And then you'll find the one of God's choosing and the covenant happens and wow, sparks fly. It's going to be awesome. Now, in the blessing, we tell the parents, hear from God and speak a prophetic blessing. And parents go, I, I love it when you have Baptists that you're marrying and they have no clue what a prophetic word is. That's, and you get to explain it to them. <laughs> hear from God, speak a blessing. Now, at Jared's wedding... Jared and Tiff's wedding. Thank you for keeping me straight. Tiff's parents are born-again believers. Born-again, spirit-filled believers. How cool is that? During the wedding, during the wedding, we came, we had Jared and Tiff stand up front. Roxanne and Lee came forward, and Lou and Carol Lowe came forward, and all four spoke publicly, spoke blessing over this marriage. God, was it awesome. It was powerful. It was so neat. Okay? To speak a blessing. Oh, oh yeah. To get a chance to publicly lay hands on your kids and speak a blessing. Ha, how neat was that? The Bible says, do not curse. Don't have to. Okay? No curse involved. Well, I want to speak a blessing. See, usually in a covenant, there was both blessings and cursings of the covenant, right? Here's what happens to you if you break this covenant. I don't have to say that because in the terms of the covenant, you said, till death do us part. When you part, you cause the death. I'm sorry, that's the curse. That's right. That's right. It's getting quiet. Okay? It, listen, this stuff is real. This is real stuff. I'm not messing with marriages. Wait till next week. Next week's going to be really fun. We're going to have some fun time. Here's one thing people ask me. What happens if a couple both unsaved, get married. And then one of them gets born again. Should, should they divorce? No. Can God bless that marriage? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, he can. How do you pray? What do you do for the one that's being a real jerk about the thing? Well, which one? The Christian or the non-Christian? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. What do you do? I'll tell you next week. Okay. <laughs> I might as well get in trouble today, right? It's as good a day as any. <laughs> One of the seven blessings in life. What are the seven stages of blessing? Seven areas of blessing. There's conception, in the womb, birth, 
as an infant toddler or during the, con the constructive years? Developmental. Developmental. Constructive, hopefully. <laughs> then, comes, <laughs> then comes the coming of age, the wedding, and an older age. One of the seven. What? You're just being, you being a bad kitty. Bad kitty. Okay. <laughs> There's a story there. Forget it. Now, anyway, one of the seven stages in life where a blessing is really needed. I love this aspect. When we went into Russia, we went all over these places. And we met all these couples that almost every single couple in the room had not had a blessing. Why? Because they got married against the wishes of their parents. Why? Because they did not get married in the Russian Orthodox Church. So they were discommunicated, excommunicated. They were disbanded from the family as if they were dead. And I had the vast privilege of being able to stand in their presence and lay hands on them and bless them. And they, oh, it's so powerful. And they would just cry, both of them, husband and wife, just cry. They got a blessing. And then they started calling me Papa. You know? So I got all these Russian kids all over the former Soviet Union. All these brothers and sisters you didn't even know you had. This one guy was so cool. I can't remember where it was. He was so tall. Is that in Mariupol? And this guy, big, big guy. And their, their marriage was actually cursed. Their parents spoke cursing against them. We got to speak the blessing and watch this whole thing come together. And he was so tall, I had to put my hand on his chest. No, it wasn't put my hand on his head. I couldn't reach it. Put my hand on his chest and he just, he cried and cried. Got my arm all soggy from tears. He just cried and he hugged me and it just about crushed me. I gotta breathe here, okay? But he just wouldn't let go. And he says, Papa, spasiba, Papa, spasiba, Papa. Just, whew. I can still hear him say that. It's so cool. Okay, I'm, I'm better. Okay. Let's talk about communion. Communion is so cool. Why should we have communion at a wedding service? Well, you don't have to, but what is it? This is so cool. It's covenant language. Hasn't everything we've talked about been covenant language so far? Everything's been covenant. Covenant, covenant, covenant. What is communion? Well, it's the first priestly duty. The first priestly duty of the husband to have communion with his wife. How cool is this? It's bringing our covenant, this brand new covenant we're making, we're putting it right under his, and we're doing all this covenant stuff. We're breaking the bread of covenant. We're drinking the wine of covenant. What, is we, what are we doing? This whole thing is our covenant, putting our covenant under his covenant. Her covenant with him into our covenant and his back and forth. How cool is this? It's a three-way established covenant. Three-way established covenant right in front of everybody to watch. We, we see this. It's a sign to all that this is of God. Come here, my wife. Isn't she wonderful? I have the microphone so I can say you're my better half. See? It works for me. Now I want you to watch this. You guys get to watch this. This is fun. <laughs> I, can, I can do this. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get through it, but it's okay. This is the bread of Jesus Christ. He was broken for us that we may be healed. This is the bread of fellowship. And when the bread of fellowship is given in communion, what they would do is they would, I would break the bread and I would hand it to you. And you'd break the bread and hand it to me. And this was saying, our life is now broken and the sustenance of the other is dependent upon me. And then Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. And as you eat it, you receive my sustenance. And it's my privilege as a husband to break the bread and to give to you. Because I know that he has said, as we are breaking his, his body and eating his bread, that he and I together are going to work as he makes me closer to him. We will be the sustenance for you. And our life is broken for you. And I want you to eat that. What a privilege. Isn't that cool? You see the covenant? Isn't this neat? I'm not doing well. I'm emotionally a fritz. Okay. Okay, it's your turn. You're not. I know. I'll pay it later too. 
my covenant with you. That we are one. Isn't this interesting? Fiha. I receive this. You see how God's going to work in covenant to work in covenant? Isn't that cool? Now, you ready for this part? This is, this is, this is deep. This is going to ruin whoever's going to do communion next month. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to throw a joke or two or else I'm never going to last. Okay, be nice. I do. Jesus shed his blood. This is a symbol of Jesus' blood that has been shed for us to make covenant. Since I'm the representative of Jesus in the church, my blood is also forfeit. My blood for you. Jesus' blood makes us clean. Would you drink that, please? That's why we use (laughs) non-alcoholic. She does the same thing. I won't put her on the spot that bad. (laughs) But notice I take her cup. What is it? It's the blood of Jesus that is cleansed, that makes her who she is, and she gives to me her cup. How cool. You can do the arm entwined thing. I tend to spill. Thank you, my sweet. You may sit down for a while. Cool or what? Don't you want to do that with your wife? Well, I'll let you go home and do it. You can do it. Where'd my thingy? There's it is. Okay. Let's talk about the unity candle. Now, I worked hard on these graphics. I want you to see this, okay? <laughs> this is really funny. Unity candle... Is when you have two candles on the outside and they're 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 lit. Usually, they have somebody come up in a wedding. They come down the aisle and they have the little long things. And somebody doesn't know how to run one and they put the wick way out there and it smokes real bad or they put it out. And what you got to do is you got to find out who's the pyromaniacs in your family and let them light them. It'll always go right. Of course, they might light up the other stuff and around, but it's going to be fun. Whatever, it's going to be good. <laughs> so they let somebody come up. And I didn't think that was going to work. I'm going to have to. Let's not set the pulpit on fire, right? Okay, you have two outside candles. Okay, watch my candles up here. This is really funny. Okay? Individual lights come together to light one. And then individual lights are blown out because there's no return. It's the point of no return. I'm not going back to my individual life. A three way established covenant. That's cool. That's that fun. It's hard to see. Okay? We are the light of the world, and he is the light. Now, the way this works is like this. I'm not going to lose that. Okay, come here, my wife. Now, we both take our candle. Yes. And we together, hopefully we can do this, we light this candle. Okay, and then we blow this candle out. And we have learned over years and years of experience, people will light it, and then they'll blow it out here, and they'll blow out that one too. Okay, and what does that leave? That leaves the one candle. Now, there's a lot more wax in this candle than there is in those two. We are synergism. We are better and bigger together than we ever were apart. 
These candles are never to be lit again. Okay? Never to be lit. I'm starting to ring, brother. And why? The death to independent living. I have taken my candle, which was my light. It becomes a light together, and I blow this one out. I'm never going back here. The point of no return. I'm not going back to an individual lifestyle. I'm never going back. I'm living for her. What happens if she dies? She lives long. She lives in me. She continues. Okay? I'm living her life. Man, this is, this is awesome. Death to independent living. I'm not going back to that. Never again. Never. What's the symbolism? He is the light. We, we, we try to get the mothers to light these candles because the mothers are the ones that come up and they light these and they say, we gave light to that kid. But it's not the light of biological life. It's the light of spiritual life. I am the light of the world. I am? Yes. Jesus, the light himself, is living within me. And he, called, he said, you are the light of the world. Man, this is too cool. When I take my light, I add it to her light, and what do we got? We're brilliant. Okay? How awesome is that? Is that cool? I love the unity candle stuff. And it goes so quick. Take a light, walk, done. Okay? And they're supposed to have a song during this time. Somebody says, oh, and they have 14 verses later, and they're done having communion, they're done having the candle, and the couple just stands there going, okay. Oh, no. That's not a good thing. This is going to blow out my unity candle. Okay. I can continue, because uh, i got still got the notes here. Let's talk about the change of name. The change of name. Today's society, that's tough, isn't it? People say, no, I'm not changing no name. I believed in my dad's name. I'm proud of our family. Tough. Okay, there's a reason why there's a change of name in the wife only. Now, has it always been that way? Yeah. You gather the name of the husband. Through that, through all the Jewish tradition, through all of the past. Why? Because it shows a weaker being brought into the covenant of a stronger. Now, again, women are not lesser, but the Bible says that they are a weaker vessel. Why does it say it that way? Because it's a weaker person of covenant. It is the understanding of a covenant of there's a stronger and a weaker. The, high, the idea is the name change is very, very important. A weaker takes on the stronger's name. Now, Jesus did not take on my name. I took on his. He is not a Lean. I am a Christian. Fascinating, isn't it? He envelops me. He envelops me. He completely, he, he takes me. How cool is that, okay? Jesus doesn't take my name. I take his uh, and then they are one name. Now, this is one of those funny little things that God did in Russia. Um, we had this couple that wanted us to train them in marriage ministries. His name was um, Amiran Adamian. Amiran Adamian. In Georgian language, his name is Amiran Adam. A-D-A-M. Okay, but they put the, the ending on the... All people from Georgia have that I-A-N ending on it. So his name is Adam. He's Adamian, Adamian. He's Amiran Adamian. He married Marina. Now Marina is kind of a fascinating. She got his name Adam. Together they are Adam. Okay? Now you take the, the name Amiran and you mix up the letters, you can spell Marina. Marina. You mix up Marina and you can spell Amiran. And so they're all mixed up together, but they are Adam. It's the neatest name thing I'd ever seen, okay? And they are in charge of marriage ministries in Moscow, okay? They're in charge of, of doing all this marriage stuff that we trained them in. And every time we got together, we said, I'd like to introduce to you, Adam. They are Adam. End of discussion. You know? <laughs> I thought that was too, too cool. Okay? But they are now this new name. They are one flesh, and the name lasts. Let me talk about your families very briefly. Should you get rid of your family name? Yes. I could get rid of Eddie, I would. Say, why? I'm dead. I died to Eddie. Is there good things out of the Eddie family? Oh, yes. 
the legacy of my dad taking us to church and the wonderful things he did? Yes, what a wonderful legacy. Am I of that family? No. I died. My old man Adam is dead. Dude, I received blessing from the Eddie family. Yes, I did. And that blessing all was in Jesus Christ, so therefore I'm in Christ's family. If I could get rid of the Eddie name, I would. If there's a way I could link it into Jesus Christ's name, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Does that mean I'm, I'm forsaking all the beauty? No. No. I'm proud of the things my dad did. Many of them. Some of them I'm not so proud of. He also gave me a legacy of pornography. Okay? I'm dead. Folks, listen. You can be blessed with a family, but get rid of the curses. Okay? Let's understand the covenant we're under. Okay? I'm not trying to just... I'm just going against culture. Culture now is going, okay, if, if we'd done this correctly, she'd be Roxanne Thompson Eddie and I'd be Lee Eddie Thompson. No. I'm Lee Eddie. She's Roxanne Eddie. We've come under covenant. We are one flesh. And it shows that Jesus is the head of the church. That's where we're going with it. That's my opinion. That's what I see in Scripture. If you want to do it the other way, that's fine with me. I can't change anything. I can't force anything. I'm just teaching you where that comes from. Okay. Uh, how about change of property rights? Yeah, in covenant. Uh, it's no longer ours. It's mine. Right? No. It's no longer mine. It's ours. We've got to understand this. And everything I own is hers. It's ours, actually. When we got married, and she gets all the swords. <laughs> I'll fight for her every time. Dang. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a little family debate. You'll get there. All that is mine is hers. All that is hers is mine. Now, when we got married, I owned a 62 Chevy 2 Nova. It was mostly blue. With a white fender and a brown hood and a brown fender. Mostly blue. A little six-cylinder banger in it with a Hearst speed shifter in it. Why? <laughs> uh, she had a really nice little Volkswagen Bug, white, named DR, stood for Downhill Racer. Okay, Who won on this one? Well, she got a 62 Chevy 2 Nova. <laughs> and I got this really cool little Volkswagen. Okay, When we got married, I was in debt, and she had some money. This worked out for me very well. Because all that I owe is also hers, not just what I own. It's no longer my debt, it's our debt. Okay? And it's no longer my money, from her point of view. It's our money. It's our finances. Folks, that makes me understand what that does. God will provide for my wife. What is the number one path that he will provide for her? Through me. Why would I mess with that by taking that money and doing something else with it? My responsibility is to do that money absolutely and perfectly straight financially. It has nothing to do with me getting my toys, me doing... No, we will pay attention to the finances because God is holding me the, the, uh, responsible for being the steward of the money of our fi family. Whoa. Money's not to be just spent, spent helter-skelter, okay? Spent. It's to be done correctly. Why? I'm responsible for that. I'm the head. And it's going to come on me. And that's Jesus Christ holding me as a standard. How fun is that? Um, the death to independent living? You got that straight. Okay, everything I own, everything I owe, our finances are under God. Okay, I got ahead of myself there. Here's a fun one. Talk about your covenantal understanding in our wedding, and I'm not going to do this with her. <laughs> it would be embarrassing, maybe. How many of you buff dudes carried your wife across the threshold? You couldn't lift her? What were you, a paraplegic or something? What? There you go! <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> He's still your stud hero, isn't he? That's right. <laughs> How much did you have to drink? No, I had nothing to do with it. I'm with you. I hear you. I hear you. It's a, I'm not saying it always works out perfectly and the wonderful thing. But listen, why do we do that? Oh, folks, of all people on the planet, you should know about Threshold Covenant. 
It's number three in the whole disc set. Number three. We've been doing Threshold Covenant for how long? That's what we do in Passover. What are you doing? In Threshold Covenant, you're taking your wife and you are saying, I carry her into my covenant. She is coming under my house. This doesn't mean she's coming up under her own power so she can leave under her own power. What does this mean? Is we are one flesh coming into a covenantal understanding of the Threshold Covenant. It is up to me to make sure she always has a roof. It's up to me to make sure she always has food. It's up to me to make sure she always has clothing and warmth. And that's true here on this one. I'm the one that brings her her warmth. <laughs> if she gets cold, she knows what you... And she sucks right up to the old body. She's a heat sucker. She just feels the heat disappear. Just like amazing. Heat seeker too. She's... She comes in. Everything's going. <laughs> okay. All that that entails in the threshold covenant is shown in this covenant. Everything. I will die first before her life is forfeit. Everybody else in the house is forfeit before she is. Think of, of Lot and what he had to do to save those angels. Fascinating. Okay. This is covenant, not performance. Amen there. And this is my commitment. Oh, I had a hard time reading that one. And I'm not going to exhibit this one for you. I'm just going to talk about it. The consummation of the wedding. What's that? Well, that's that night you get together. And that's the first time the husband and wife come together in that oh-so-intimate understanding of intimacy. They say that nice? They just say, but that's when they have sex, okay? Got it? Okay, that's just, I didn't want to disappoint her. Okay, okay. What is this all about? Well, this is kind of, kind of really interesting. This is only, sex is only for covenant. Only. Anything outside of covenant is called fornication. Before covenant, during covenant, whatever. Anything outside of that covenant is fornication, adultery, bad news stuff. Deadly. God says absolutely against it. You will not do that. This is covenant stuff. This is the understanding of intimacy that Jesus had uh, for his bride. He wants us to understand intimacy with him. He gave us the physical intimacy so we would understand the spiritual intimacy and what we have taken and perverted the whole thing. Okay? Ah, oh, the things I have heard and seen from the world and the way they have taken sex is so stupid. It doesn't work. Now, the other thing is, and I didn't bring a knife or anything, and I didn't even put it up on the screen. No knife or nothing, but it is the use of the covenant marking. What is a covenant marking? Circumcision. Okay, when this was first done, what was this? Abraham had to use his covenant marking. God said, when you will circumcise yourself, you're circumcised, that thing is now mine. And every time you use it, you're using it in my name. And this will bring you the fulfillment of what I have told you is going to happen in that covenant. You'll be the father of many nations. Whew, how fun. Well, this is what God has given us. The consummation of that wedding is to do what? Use my covenant marking to make a soul tie with my wife. Sex always makes a soul tie, every single time. Every single time. What's the idea? It's for us to become more one flesh, more one flesh, more one flesh, more one flesh. The idea is this intimacy is to get us closer. Why? This intimacy with Jesus is to also get us closer and closer and closer. Folks, I cannot get away from it. You say, but Lee, that's weird to say, you know... Intimacy with Jesus, worship with Jesus is the same thing as sex. I'm not the one who said it. The Bible said it. Almost every time in the Old Testament when one of the countries or one of the, the children of Israel the, in Israel were to be idolatrous, they would have idols. Jesus called them an adulterous nation. You're having adultery against me. I married you and look what you're doing. He used the correlation of sex, not me. Okay? He's the one that made it. Fascinating. And then comes something very interesting. In many, 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 many cultures, what would they do? They would take a sheet in first, and everybody's outside waiting. <laughs> this is a little awkward, okay? A little awkward. And you just got married, and they all send you in to the bedroom, and they're all outside waiting. <laughs> they want to see blood on the sheet. Why? There's the spilling of blood for covenant. But it shows total holding each other, total accountability of us being virgins before the whole idea is that only in God can there be the covenant and can there be purity. The whole thing behind the blood is the blood covenant. That's where it's the consummation is so important. It spills the blood. Fascinating. 
If you need to know more about that, you can talk to my wife in private. She'll explain it to you in minute detail. And actually, she'll send you to Rick. Uh, <laughs> I've always wondered. <laughs> okay, and Rick will send you to Randall. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> He's going to bounce around the church for a while. I can see that. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is the... How are we doing? Oh, my word. In Luke... Everybody look this up. Luke chapter 15, 8 through 10. And we'll do this very, very quickly. Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. I bet, I bet you always wondered about this, why this is such a big deal. Luke chapter 15. Starting to ring again, Marty, a little bit. 8 through 10. Jesus is talking about parables. He's talking about the hundred sheep and all this sort of stuff. But then he says, Or what woman having ten drachmas... If she loses one drachma, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and look carefully till she finds it. In finding it, she calls together the friends and, and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the drachma which I lost. I say to you, so there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner repenting. Anybody ever really wonder why that was so important? A drachma was not much money. It was not much anything. It was just a pfft, nothing. And she loses one. What, are they so strapped for cash? That the husband comes home and find out that she lost a drachma and he's going to beat her up or whatever? No, no, no. See, we're missing the cultural understanding here. There was a 10-day period of their wedding coming up to the, the final day. 10-day period. And he would take 10 drachma coins, 10 common coins. And he would take them. They were silver. Shows purity. And he would come and he would drop these 10 coins into her lap. And the whole idea behind it was, I'm pure, and I'm bringing my purity to you and your purity together. Isn't this cool? Mm -hmm. Ten of them. Ten of these drachmas. Well, she, what she would do was they had a little hole drilled in them, and she would weave a little thing on it and wear it across her head. And she would wear this thing, and it would be proof to everybody of she was coming into this covenant purely. And so was he. And it was a covenant understanding of we're in covenant together, and we are pure together. She had ten drachmas, and they would wear those, sir. It covered her mind, too. Very, very good. He needed them. <laughs> Forget it. Anyway, that's a whole purity conference issue. But, that's <laughs> but when they got home, and he carried her across the threshold, she was in the threshold, the house was under the covenant, she would take those ten coins and hang them up on the wall. And they would all see them. And everybody who come in would see the proof of their purity in covenant. She lost one. Wow. This is a big deal. Oh, no. The proof, the proof of my purity is gone. I've lost a drachma. And she swept the house and cleaned it. And she's all freaking out. But when she found it, she called all her neighbors and they had a celebration party because it proved her covenant and purity. And then the Bible says, so the angels rejoice over one sinner that's found. It's bringing back the fullness of the covenant. Isn't that a cool story? Amen. Okay. I thought you liked that. Okay, one more little illustration and then we're done. Jared, Teresa's son Jared made this for me. Two pieces of metal that are no longer two pieces of metal. I'm going to pass this around. This is so cool. They were two, now they're one. Why? They're welded. Meaning what? The substance of one piece of metal was melted into the substance of another piece of metal with a third piece of metal, a third alloy being brought in to mix them together, the, the weld is stronger than either piece of steel. Right, Marty? This shows me and my wife are being joined by the heat of covenant of Jesus Christ, and he has added himself to it and made us stronger. And now we are one piece. Now, this is one piece. To break these welds, I'd have to break the metal. I mean, it just this is not going to happen. This is not easy to break these two apart. I don't want to just pass this around. You guys can start looking at it. And to separate those, both pieces of metal will be damaged. Very, very important. Pass that thing around. Death to independent living. Each of us lives for the other person. Not a contract. Not based on performance, but on commitment. Not based on performance, but commitment. And we're going to be really looking at that next week. That's a very, very big deal. Our covenant is on every single front of our lives. Everything we're doing is covenant-based. Okay? I wanted to bring that to you. Okay.
If we do this earthly covenant, we begin to understand the heavenly covenant. If we can get this one under, under bear, we, we can understand the other one better. If, uh, if we are selfish in this covenant, <laughs> then we will miss the depth of that one. If I'm selfish in this one, I'm going to miss the depth of that one. How many husbands do I know are missing the depth of their walk with Jesus Christ because they don't have the guts to walk it at home? Amazing to me. Amazing to me. We must learn to die to self for us to know Jesus' way of coming to life. You've got to die to self to have his way of coming into life. God gave us covenant. Covenant is the key. Marriage is the teacher. Covenant is the key. Marriage is the teacher. Are we learning anything yet? Well, I hope we're learning. Now, how about that for a marriage seminar? Okay? In one shot. I always wonder how come I'm so tired on, on Sunday afternoons. I feel like I run a marathon through these things. But did, I know I was fast. But did you get it? Did you get it? Isn't this fantastic? I want us, this church, to be a fortress for marriage. A fortress for the family. Now... Teaser time, as if I haven't already done those for you. Teaser time. Next week, after we've established the, the foundation of marriage and what God has intended, next week, I'm going to get the hard passages covered. I'm going to show you what the Scripture says about divorce and remarriage. I'm going to show you the whole thing. Why would I do that? Because I'm a glutton for punishment, and I love alienating people. Say, that can't be true, but that's the way it seems to look, okay? No, I want you to understand what the Scripture has to say. I want you to understand the Scripture. Folks, there's so many lies out there that we don't know what the Scripture says. I want to show you what the Scripture says. This is covenant. This is a big deal. We're going to be right back in Malachi chapter 2. We're going to show you again, okay? This is important. Am I going to do this in condemnation? No, 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 no. I have never condemned anybody. Here's the thing, though. It's a highly emotional issue. And so people get emotional, and they get, you're, you're condemning me, I'm bad, I must be, I must be Attila the Hun and Hitler all wrapped up into one. Yeah. Well, you know, no, you, you, you're, you're saying I'm just evil. No, 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 no. Understand, and I need your prayers for this week, because we are going to just hit the scripture, I'm not condemning anybody. Do I have hope? Yes. I am probably one of the most hope-filled people for marriage that there is on the planet, because I'll look at a totally...